I'm going to talk a little bit about um, blood pressure and cardiac output. We need to have a certain amount of cardiac output to make sure that we have enough uh, blood and therefore enough oxygen and glucose going to all of the cells. So our cardiac output has to be high enough for all of our uh, cells to be perfused. If not, then we go into a state of um, shock or hypovolemia. So if we look at cardiac output, we need to know the heart rate, which is the beats per minute, and then the stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that is pumped out with each contraction of the a ventricle. Usually it's the left ventricle that gets measured. Now we don't have a way pre-hospitally to measure this, but there are actually ways that they can measure how much blood is coming out of the ventricle. Um, I think it's called the ejection fraction, um, so it's not real important to us. Now typically we have a heart rate of let's say 80 beats per minute, and normally the stroke volume of a left ventricle is about 70 uh, milliliters and that's 80 beats per minute. So if we were to multiply these together, we would end up with about 5,600 milliliters per minute, <clears throat> um, which you know we could also just write as 5.6 liters. So that might give you an idea about how much blood is being pumped through your heart each uh, minute. Uh, again, that's beats per minute multiplied by milliliters per beat, and then we end up with the total. Now, um, heart rate is dependent on your sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic nervous systems, and remember beta 1 uh, stimulates the heart rate, so beta 1 causes your heart to beat faster and stronger. But let's talk about stroke volume. Stroke volume is dependent on three things three things, uh, tongue twister there, three things. One is preload, which is the amount of blood that is returning uh, back to the heart. So we know that from the superior and inferior being a cava, we have blood returning back up to the heart, and the amount that is coming back um, is considered our preload. So that's the amount returning. And um, we can lower this, if you imagine being um, a, a patient that has been injured and is bleeding out, and they spilled a lot of blood out onto the ground, then obviously less blood is coming back to the heart. The second factor that we look at when we're looking at stroke volume is contractility. And this is the uh, strength of the, um, of the heartbeat. And um, heart muscle, I think all muscle, but definitely heart muscle has a, uh, a stretching property. So the further it gets stretched, the stronger the contraction. You can almost think of this as like a rubber band. If you were going to pop one of your friends with a rubber band, you'd want to stretch it back far, just enough to make it sting. But if you stretch it back too far, then it breaks. Um, so, but the further you stretch the muscle, the stronger the um, the contraction. And that's the Frank Stallings effect, um, or Stallings law. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the greater the contraction, the um, or the greater the um, stretching of it, the stronger the contraction. Um, so that's part of contractility. Another part of it is just how strong the muscle is. So if you can imagine maybe this person had part, had part of their heart muscle that died because of a heart attack, you know, this here might just be dead. And obviously that muscle then, that myocardium, is not nearly as, as strong as it used to be. So then the contractility would go down. Um, beta-1 also causes contractility to go up. So we want to remember things like uh, when we're looking at contractility, we obviously have beta-1, which increases it. We have the Frank Stalling, which um, the greater the stretch, the more it increases. And we can have things like an MI, a myocardial infarction, that would decrease it. Um, <clears throat> so all this is just how strong the, the heart can beat. The third factor is the afterload, and this is the resistance that the blood or the heart needs to pump against. So in a, um, a typical younger person, the artery is pretty open, um, the blood's pretty viscous, it's not very thick, and it can move pretty easily. But as we age, our blood vessels become thicker and less elastic. So I'm just making them look a little thicker. They don't stretch as much, 
you know, you may have some plaque and stuff build up in there. You know, as you've eaten all those good, um, good tasting foods and donuts and things like that, you get some plaque building up in there. And the blood itself might just become kind of thicker. So I'm just going to draw some extra stuff in there. So it just is harder for it to move. And that's afterload. And actually increasing afterload will increase the blood pressure, but it will decrease the amount of blood flowing through it. <clears throat> so blood pressure itself is um, cardiac output. And remember, cardiac output is dependent on heart rate. It's dependent on preload. It's dependent on contractility or strength of the heartbeat. And it's dependent on afterload. So that's all this cardiac output thing. But then what is systemic vascular resistance? Um, and, and you have to excuse my drawings. I'm, I'm getting better, but I'm, I'm, I'm still no artist. Um, we've talked a little bit about this already with the fight or flight response. And I've mentioned that when we get scared or we get startled or something happens and we get an adrenaline release, we have alpha-1 released and alpha-2. And those cause the blood vessels to get more narrow or constricted. So instead of it being wide like that, it might be narrowed like this. Now, this is not the central. These are peripheral or systemic vascular resistance. So it gets smaller. It goes from wide to narrow. And we see this in the skin because the skin begins to look pale and it starts to feel cool because there's not as much blood flowing through it. And what's happening there is the blood is now being shunted to the big muscles and the big organs in the center or the central part of the body instead of the systemic part. So if we look at a typical blood pressure, um, it is um, systolic over diastolic. And we know that the average is 120 over 80. By the way, rarely is somebody exactly 120 over 80. I used to work with the fire department. Every time we showed up on scene, they had taken a blood pressure. and It was always 120 over 80, which let me know pretty darn quickly that they really didn't check it because nobody's really 120 over 80. But what do these two things represent? The systolic or systole... Um, <clears throat> If I should write that in here also, learning our term, systole. Um, I think I spelled that wrong. Let me just erase that and try that again. That was bad, Todd. Um, so systole, there we go. Uh, that means the contraction. And we usually, um, when we're talking blood pressure, we always are thinking the left contraction. There is a way to measure the blood pressure from the right ventricle contracting. Um, that's called your pulmonary uh, blood pressure. Um, we don't measure it pre-hospitally, but that's a, a real important factor when you start thinking about uh, people that have COPD, bronchitis. Um, there's something called pulmonary hypertension, which can lead to some lung damage. It's not a way for us to measure that pre-hospitally, but we can measure the left ventricle, because when the left ventricle contracts, the blood blows out the aorta and then flows out to the systemic circulation. So if you put a blood pressure cuff around somebody's upper arm, <clears throat> um, around the humerus, you can then measure the brachial artery at the antecubital fossa region and putting in all those medical terms. And right there at the elbow, you can measure their blood pressure. And the top number that you hear, the thump, first thump you hear, is the strength of the ventricles contracting, the left ventricle contraction. The bottom number is when the ventricles are relaxing. Um, there's nothing happening there. They're just relaxing. Actually, there is stuff happening um, diastole. They, uh, they're filling back up. So during diastolic part, the atria are contracting and pushing the blood down into the ventricles. This causes the ventricles to stretch. Remember that from the Frank Stalling effect? And allows them to... Um, beat stronger. That's called an atrial kick. Atrial kick. Um, it just allows the heart to beat a little bit stronger. Um, another thing that you could, or another way you can think of diastolic and systolic is systolic, we're measuring the pulse pressure as it comes through the artery. So we're in essence measuring how strong the left ventricle is. When we're in diastolic mode and we're getting the bottom number, we're measuring just the amount of pressure that's left in the blood vessel itself. And that's a measure of um, contraction, or not contraction, constriction, uh, vasoconstriction. So the higher 
the um, diastolic blood pressure, the more constricted or narrow the um, the peripheral or systemic vascular uh, circulation is. So, I'm talking diastolic here. We can go from a, if this is, let's say, 80, if we go to a more constricted one, so it's, but now we just have a little, it's swollen up, it's constricted, but just a little opening there. You can see the little opening now. Maybe that's 90. So now we have a way to measure how constricted our blood vessels are. That's going to be real important when we start looking at shock. <clears throat> so let's look at um, the difference between the two. We call that a pulse pressure, and this is another thing that is important when it comes to shock. So if we look at the systolic and the diastolic, if we look at the difference between them, so if I were to take 120 and subtract 80 from it, I would then have 40, and that's millimeters of mercury. That would be my pulse pressure. If I take 130 minus 70, I would then have 60. If I have 110 minus 84, I think that's 26. Yes, yeah, 26. So the 26 would be more narrow, and the 60 would be wide compared to normal, compared to our average of, of 40. Um, we see narrowing pulse pressures when we're going into shock. And what happens with shock, um, just real briefly, I'll spend some more time on it in another video. Um, our, our systolic blood pressure, um, as, as we, the brain starts to sense the blood loss, it releases um, sympathetic nervous system stimulation and releases adrenaline, which is, increases the beta-1 and the alpha-1. Um, so the beta-1 and the sympathetic cause our blood pressure, our ventricle, to contract stronger. So initially, our systolic blood pressure starts to go up. Now, as our um, blood vessels begin to constrict, our systemic vascular circulation, our um, <clears throat> diastolic blood pressure will also start to go up. And what we see happen is eventually the systolic starts to drop, and the diastolic will drop also, but it drops later. So you can see that they get closer and closer together. So you may end up with blood pressures as we stay at, you know, going through time when we go like 120 over 80, and then maybe we'll go to, I don't know, 130 over 86, and then it can't go up anymore because we've lost too much blood. So maybe they might go down to like 110 over 90. And you can see that the systolic and the diastolic are, are getting closer together. And that's a sign of shock. And narrowing pulse pressure is a pretty good indicator of shock. Remember, the top number is how strong the, the ventricles are contracting, and the bottom number is how vasoconstricted your uh, peripheral systemic vascular resistance is. Hope this helps. Thanks.